This program is brought to you by Emory University. Sorry about the delay, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get going. Um, before we start, just a reminder that we're in our final week of our, uh, our children's drive for the uh, children in the county, uh, Fulton County court system that we're supporting over the holiday season. And I know you've all been blitzed by a bunch of emails on that, but if you haven't had a chance to participate, we still have a few more days left. I think our official ending day is Tuesday, but we're going to stretch that out a little bit to try to try to hit our goal. But for those of you who contributed, we greatly appreciate uh, your contribution. And it's a pretty important cause, a real good opportunity for us to give back to the community. And, uh, uh, and again, I appreciate those of you that have helped us out already. And with that, we'll go ahead and get going. Uh, this morning, our speaker is Dr. Creton Mavromatis, uh, who's an assistant professor here in the Division of Cardiology. Uh, Creton did his uh, medical uh, training in Washington and came here, for, or residency in Washington, came here for fellowship in cardiology and uh, did his general cardiology training, did some uh, basic research work with Zarina Gallus originally, uh, and then uh, did his uh, general cardiology training and then advanced training in interventional cardiology. Uh, he's built his uh, career around a very successful clinical research career with uh, over 20 publications and several of them very high impact. In fact, one of our recent inductees in the Millie Pub Club uh, for his uh, work has been involved in some of the major clinical trials and uh, uh, related to coronary ischemia and revascularization and some work in endothelial progenitor cells and regenerative medicine. Um, and today, he's, uh, and recently, has been uh, a member of the TAVR team. And uh, today, he's going to talk to us about uh, TAVR and uh, give us an update. Krita? Thank you, Bob. Um, uh, yeah, so TAVR has been a pretty fast moving uh, field. Um, over the last uh, 10 years, I guess, or 12 years now, it's developed uh, since the first implant in 2002. Um, since CE mark approval in about 2007, and since the partner results uh, were presented um, at the first randomized study of TAVR in 2010, even since then there's been a lot of changes. What, what I'd like to do today is review some of the developments and findings um, that have occurred over the last year. Uh, we'll start out with a few words about surgical uh, aortic valve replacement outcomes, then get into a little bit about the TAVR trial outcomes, um, talk a little bit about TAVR's commercial uh, history here in the United States and how it's been doing, and then finally uh, touch on some future directions that TAVR is uh, taking. Let's talk a little bit about surgical outcomes. Surgical AVR is a big procedure and it's growing. Uh, some a study was recently released uh, in JAMA in um, 2013, which looked at 82 million Medicare beneficiaries and looked at their um, how much surgical AVRs are being performed and how well those surgical AVRs are being performed. Um, as you can see, uh, in some select years here, the volume of surgical AVRs being performed in the United States as reflected in this Medicare database has been increasing steadily, over 30,000 in 2011. Uh, the number of um, surgical AVRs being performed per Medicare beneficiary has increased, probably a reflection of the growing incidence of aortic stenosis as a disease in our aging population. And the 30-day mortality um, for surgical AVR has really plummeted, uh, almost 50% to around 4% uh, 30-day mortality. So surgical AVR really has been a great procedure and it's been growing and it's been getting better and it's the gold standard for um, aortic valve replacement and the treatment of aortic stenosis. Be that being said, uh, studies have shown that there are many patients who are not being re uh, re referred for surgical AVR despite their severe symptomatic aortic stenosis. In general, the ranges have been about 30% of patients with uh, severe aortic stenosis who have not been uh, referred um, for treatment because of fears about the risks of surgery. Um, even at Emory, uh, there has been um, some data showing that about 20% of our patients 
who have severe symptomatic aortic stenosis um, in the pre-TAVR days were not being referred for um, surgical AVR. So surgical AVR is good, but it's not reaching all of our patients. This is where TAVR has um, had its biggest impact and where TAVR started. Um, and now I'd like to talk a little bit about the TAVR trial outcome, starting with those regarding the Sapien valve. The Sapien, Edward Sapien valve, I think most people know, is a um, balloon expandable valve that can be delivered uh, via catheter through the femoral artery or sometimes some alternative access routes to the um, aortic valve area, to the aortic annulus, and using a balloon, it can be deployed in the native aortic valve, um, stenotic aortic valve annulus, and left there in place as a functioning new working valve. Partner, partner B specifically was the first trial to, first randomized controlled trial, um, to look at the efficacy of this valve. And it focused on inoperable patients, 360 of them, who were otherwise um, going to only get standard medical therapy for their aortic stenosis. And these patients were randomized either to standard therapy or to receive the transcatheter valve. Um, standard therapy at that time included, for the most part, balloon valvuloplasty. Patients were then followed um, for uh, now up to three years, with the three-year results being released um, earlier this year. About 12% of the patients in the standard therapy group crossed over. That being said, um, uh, the three-year results uh, are as seen here. Um, mortality was reduced uh, significantly at one year, two years, and three years with an increasing uh, benefit over time from an absolute reduction of 20% at one year to an absolute uh, mortality reduction of about 27% at three years. Um, similarly, uh, the mortality plus stroke um, uh, had similar results with an increasing benefit over time. And finally, rehospitalization um, was also substantially reduced, sort of a surrogate for uh, hard outcomes, but also a measure of quality of life. Rehospitalization was reduced from about 76% to about 42% um, incidence at three years. So this procedure dramatically improved the prognosis in these patients with severe aortic stenosis who are otherwise inoperable and, and not eligible for surgical aortic valve replacement. Um, notably, there is still a very high mortality in the um, treated group of patients, 50% at three years. Um, it's something that I think should be noted and, and thought about. Here is a uh, look at how the patients fared symptomatically. Um, almost all the patients improved from uh, their high New York Heart Association 3 and 4 levels to um, predominantly New York Heart Association 1 and 2 levels in the uh, surgical, in, in, I'm sorry, in the um, TAVR group. Um, the medical therapy group did not fare quite as well in terms of symptomatic improvement. And of those who were still alive, again, at three years, those who had um, transcatheter aortic valve replacement felt much better than those who uh, had standard medical therapy. Now you can see again there's this large group of people here seen in red who are dead at three years. Um, this is an important phenomena because it gives us pause in terms of um, wondering if some of these patients that we referred from TAVR and went through this expensive and you know difficult sometimes procedure whether it was worth it and is there a group of patients who we could say from the outset are that shouldn't have TAVR that their prognosis probably uh, won't be um, improved much. This subgroup analysis from the Partner uh, B uh, cohort was published, dividing patients by STS score, or, or uh, um, a score which measures the patient's risks um, um, in terms of their comorbidities. Um, uh, patients who had the lowest STS scores or the lowest perioperative risks, the least amount of comorbidities, had the greatest benefit from TAVR. Um, almost immediate 
and, and growing over the three-year period, whereas patients who had very high STS scores greater than 15% um, saw very little benefit in terms of TAVR with absolutely no difference in the curves out to one year and only then um, some difference. And, and whether it's statistically significant is, is questionable. Um, so one could say that, as, as may be clinically obvious, the sickest patients who have a lot of other medical problems probably won't benefit uh, much from TAVR, but um, uh, the other patients will. Clinically speaking, figuring out on an individual basis which patients these are can be a challenge, uh, but it is something for us to keep in mind. Notably also from the partner study results, we see a large amount of cardiovascular mortality. Um, well, all these patients had their valve fixed. Why are they now dying cardiac deaths? Uh, it's a good question, um, somewhat unanswered. One thing is for sure, though, that the valve seems to be not be the problem. The replacement valve itself seems to be holding up pretty well. A few studies have now shown um, the durability of the valve, and this is one of them which actually looked at the five-year follow-up in 88 patients who had a balloon expandable, either Cribbier Edwards or Sapien uh, valve. And it showed that after a substantial improvement in aortic valve area, after the valve was placed in these patients, uh, the um, aortic valve area stayed high, uh, dropping only 0.6 centimeters squared per year. And the aortic valve gradients um, remained relatively low, increasing by only 0.27 millimeters of mercury per year. Um, in this study of these 88 patients, no patients had any valve dysfunction until year four, at which point three patients developed moderate valvular dysfunction of their um, TAVR valve, but none of them developed severe valve dysfunction requiring uh, replacement or um, other treatment. So the valve is durable. Well, partner A uh, was another aspect of the partner study. This was a different, um, uh, this study focused on a different group of patients. Namely, it focused on those patients who were not inoperable, but rather they were high risk, but could undergo surgery. So high risk for surgery, but, but surgeons were willing to operate on them. 700 such patients were um, found and enrolled. All the patients went or underwent an evaluation to see if they could have transcatheter valve replacement via the femoral route. Um, this was, uh, if this was possible, patients were then randomized into the transfemoral arm, in which case they were randomized one-to-one -to, -one to TAVR transfemorally versus surgical AVR. If this was not possible, they underwent uh, transapical TAVR, in which an incision is made um, in, the, in the left chest wall, left thoracotomy is performed, and the catheter is placed directly through the chest wall into the apex of the heart. Um, and again, patients were randomized one-to-one -one between this transapical TAVR and surgical AVR. Follow-up was uh, good, uh, over 90% out to three years. Um, and here we see the mortality curve. Uh, you can see here uh, basically the same outcomes out to three years um, with, in terms of incidence of mortality. Uh, whether you had surgical AVR or transcatheter aortic valve replacement. Um, similar uh, stroke occurrence out to three years, and again, a similar all-cause mortality plus stroke occurrence. To look at these curves a little, in a little bit more detail, I'll say that there was an early uh, separation uh, between the surgical AVR patients and the TAVR patients in terms of mortality with a little bit higher mortality at six months about 22% versus 14% in the TAVR group, but this um, evened out at about one year. Similarly, um, or oppositely, I guess I should say, there was a little higher risk of stroke in the TAVR patients, about a 2%, 3% increased risk of stroke in the TAVR patients um, in the first month after TAVR uh, as compared to surgical AVR, which then um, eventually uh, normalized uh, by three years. That being said, you can see that surgical AVR is, uh, has fairly similar results to transcatheter aortic valve replacement um, at one year, uh, in, uh, three years in terms of mortality um, and stroke. Here is their um, symptomatic uh, 
uh, status over the study period. All the patients, almost all the patients had three or four um, New York Heart Association heart failure, and almost all of them uh, had substantial improvement from their procedure, uh, with a little bit more improvement at 30 days in the TAVR group, um, but this evening out by one year and staying about the same out to three years in the TAVR and surgical AVR group. This early benefit um, uh, in terms of symptomatic improvement in the TAVR group uh, was seen also in the quality of life analysis in these patients. Again, all the patients, whether they went, underwent surgical AVR or transcatheter AVR, had a, had a very large improvement in quality of life, um, uh, 26 to 30 points, with five points considered to be um, clinically significant. Um, as you can see, the patients who underwent transcatheter aortic valve replacement, uh, again, they felt a little bit better or at one month than the patients who underwent surgical aortic valve replacement. One thing that the um, uh, researchers here noticed uh, in their uh, analysis of this data was that there was a significant interaction between the treatment effect and the access route. And so they looked at um, transfemoral TAVR patients and the transapical TAVR patients separately, and they found that the patients who underwent TAVR who transfemorally are the ones who felt much better than the surgical AD, AVR patients at one month, um, whereas the transapical TAVR patients felt very similar to the surgical AVR patients at one month. And of course, at the end of 12 months, everybody felt about the same. The difference lies, it may be fairly obvious to, to everybody here, but the difference lies in the fact that um, transapical TAVR is a more morbid procedure than transfemoral AVR. Um, difficult to directly compare in the partner study, but these investigators um, took 501 um, partner patients, uh, actually partner pairs of patients, and they propensity matched them and found that these matched patients matched for about 102 different patient characteristics. Whether they underwent TF or TA, they were matched for 102 other different characteristics. That the TA patients, the transapical patients, had higher lengths of stay in the hospital, greater chance of hospital death, greater chance of renal failure, and a greater chance of bleeding than their matched transfemoral uh, patients. There was no real difference in this matched group of patients um, with regards to stroke. Both routes seemed to cause similar amounts of stroke, but there was a slight uh, increase in the risk of death in the transapical uh, group of patients. To be fair, um, this, those results were um, looking at all partner patients. If you looked at the partner patients who were um, enrolled in the study later on, here um, seen as the non-randomized continued access cohort, um, and compared them to the surgical AVR patients or the, or the transapical TAVR patients who were um, enrolled in partner early, there was an improvement in the outcomes in the patients who were enrolled later on with less mortality, suggesting that this relatively new and novel procedure at the time um, was improving in terms of technique. Uh, the surgeons were getting better at it and their outcomes were getting better. Um, so whether these differences still hold uh, now, several years later after um, partner was studied is, is not clear, but transapical um, is uh, 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 still being used and probably still getting better. Again, like in uh, partner B, um, we see evidence of valve durability in partner A. Uh, in these high-risk surgical patients, the patients uh, all had a big improvement in valve area, whether they underwent TAVR or surgical AVR, a little better uh, valve area or increased valve size, valve area size in the TAVR patients um, early on. Uh, but all of them maintain this valve area out to three years and again maintain relatively low aortic valve gradients out to three years, evidence of the um, sapien valve's durability. One of the, so mo for the most part, um, TAVR and surgical AVR were, had very similar outcomes um, clinically in the partner A study, but one of the striking differences between the two was this phenomenon of paravalvular regurgitation, and it has been the subject of a lot of conversation and talk. Um, leaking basically around the valve, outside of the valve, in between the valve and the native annulus in which the valve is sitting. 
here we can see at 30 days there is about a 50% incidence of mild, moderate, or severe um, paravalvular regurgitation in the uh, TAVR group with a much lower incidence in the 10% range in the surgically AVR group. And while there's a little bit of reduction in um, paravalvular regurgitation with time, it seems to stabilize after one year and, and, and just kind of lingers. Um, with about a 50% or 40% occurrence of mild, moderate, or severe um, uh, paravalvular regurgitation. Why is this occurring and, and, and is it bad? Um, well, in a, in a subgroup analysis of these patients who, um, who underwent TAVR in this study, patients with none or trace um, Paravalvular regurgitation had a significantly better um, long-term or I guess intermediate three-year term outcome than those with either severe uh, paravalvular regurgitation or just <coughs> excuse me mild paravalvular regurgitation. It's pretty surprising. Um, well, obviously, we know that severe aortic regurgitation is bad, but even mild paravalvular regurgitation it seemed to make a substantial difference, or it seems to be associated with a substantial outcome difference. Um, in this group of patients. The causes of paravalvular regurgitation are um, uh, basically listed here. Annular calcification plus eccentricity of the annulus because the balloon expandable sapien valve is round. It may not fit perfectly um, in the annulus of the patient which is usually oval and in particularly if the annulus has a lot of craggy calcium uh, sticking out of it or is um, particularly non-compliant. Inaccurate sizing. Uh, sizing is not trivial in terms of deciding what size valve goes into which uh, patient's annulus. And finally, inaccurate positioning. Again, positioning uh, may not be trivial and sometimes if the position is slightly <laughs> off, there can be a substantial amount of paravalvular regurgitation. Since the um, acknowledgement of this phenomenon of paravalvular regurgitation and the um, uh, and its impact on outcomes, the uh, strategy of 3D uh, sizing of the annulus has pretty much become the gold standard. This can be done either using CT, cardiac CT, or 3D transesophageal echocardiography. Um, either way, uh, basically a good understanding of both the sagittal and the coronal diameters of the annulus um, are important so that even an area of the annulus can be derived and uh, a properly sized valve um, can be placed there. <coughs> and I think that um, is going to result, excuse me, <coughs> in the improvement um, in terms of sizing and the reduction of paravalvular regurgitation to some degree um, just using that strategy. Questions remain though regarding paravalvular regurgitation. Um, is it actually a cause of mortality? <coughs> Might need a cup of water or something if you'd be so kind. Is it, is it a cause of mortality or is it really a marker of vascular disease? Um, again, uh, uh, more calcium, less vascular compliance. Um, how is the accuracy of our quantification? Is, are we really able to say that this is mild um, paravalvular regurgitation while others uh, seem to have severe paravalvular regurgitation. It's notoriously difficult to quantitate um, paravalvular regurgitation by echocardiography and even by uh, fluoroscopy. And then the last question is, are there groups of patients in particular that are, are very um, affected by paravalvular regurgitation? Maybe those with um, very stiff uh, ventricles. Again, though, overall the clinical results were similar in the um, surgical aortic valve replacement patients um, and the transcatheter aortic valve replacement patients in these high risk um, a group of uh, surgical, thank you, thank you, um, aortic stenosis patients. So the, one of the questions, one of the other questions that came out of the study was, is there uh, some subgroups within the bigger group of patients that do better with TAVR? than surgical AVR, even though on the whole, most patients do similarly with either method. And the answer here, lie, um, the answer here is not totally clear, but one of, there are some suggestions of answers based on some subgroup analysis that have been performed in the last year. Um, this subgroup analysis that you see here focused on women, and, and the women in the uh, 
uh, Partner A study, they did substantially better at two years with um, lower mortality in the TAVR group than in the surgical AVR group. This benefit was actually predominantly seen in the transfemoral um, TAVR patients, not the transapical TAVR patients. And in the diabetics, um, patients who underwent TAVR again had um, substantially reduced uh, levels of mortality at two years uh, when they underwent TAVR as opposed to when these diabetic patients with severe AS underwent surgical AVR. So again, this, was, this benefit was seen with both the transfemoral and the transapical approaches. And, um, and uh, again, these sub-studies suggest and are, are more hypothesis generating than anything, but they suggest that there may be a benefit in these subgroups of, a substantial benefit of these subgroups of TAVR over surgical AVR. A third subgroup that was uh, recently uh, published on by um, Vasilis and some of his partner colleagues was uh, the patients with mitral regurgitation. Um, patients with mitral regurgitation uh, were looked at, very severe mitral regurgitation patients were excluded from the partner study, but um, patients with moderate to severe mitral regurgitation were enrolled. <coughs> Those who had moderate to severe mitral regurgitation um, uh, who underwent either surgical AVR or TAVR had a substantial improvement in their mitral regurgitation with a um, uh, 50 to 70 percent reduction in mitral regurgitation. Very few patients had worsened uh, mitral regurgitation. One of the interesting findings of this subgroup analysis was that the patients who uh, had mitral regurgitation, uh, moderate to severe, and underwent surgical AVR had worse outcomes than their no or mild mitral regurgitation counterparts, whereas TAVR didn't seem to make any difference um, whether the patients had mitral regurgitation or not. The outcomes were the same. This suggests that TAVR may be a better approach in those patients with moderate, moderate to severe um, functional mitral regurgitation. The newest partner results are, um, that were, have come out have been based on a newer technology um, through the Partner 2B study. Uh, these, this newer technology is called the Sapien XT. It's a variant of the Sapien valve, and basically its biggest uh, claim to fame, I should suppose, is that it can be compressed into a smaller size and therefore fit up a smaller uh, sheath with a 33% smaller cross-sectional area, um, perhaps allowing for more patients uh, to be eligible for the transfemoral approach um, with, with less risk to their femoral arteries. And these results were, uh, the one-year results were released this year of um, uh, about uh, a couple hundred patients who were inoperable for um, surgical AVR who were randomized to either receive the regular Sapien valve or this new Sapien XT. Here you can see their mortality was nearly identical out to one year. But what, you, what we did see in the smaller print was that the procedures with the Sapien XT were easier. Less anesthesia time, less aborted procedures, less intraortic balloon pump need, less major vascular complications, and less uh, disabling bleeding. So while not a big improvement in terms of mortality in the long run, it definitely uh, reduced, um, it definitely made the procedure easier and reduced procedural uh, morbidity. I would like to also talk about one of the newer valves to come out um, recently, the core valve. Uh, it's actually been around, but it's the newer, newest uh, study has been released on this um, valve and released in TCT uh, a couple or about a month ago. This valve is a little bit different than the Sapien valve. It's not balloon expandable, but rather self-expanding. It's a, it's a little bit bigger than the Sapien valve, extending further out into the aorta, outflow tract, I'm sorry, further out to the aorta and deeper into the LV. Um, it's a, it's a, therefore a bigger valve which has its own pluses and minuses compared to the Edward Sapien valve. It is, um, was recently, uh, its one year results um, on its uh, first study in the United States were recently released. Because partner B results were um, released during the, this, uh, the ongoing study of the core valve, they couldn't have a medical therapy comparator group that felt that that would be unethical um, because uh, valve replacement 
improve the patient's prognosis so much. So instead, they compared the outcomes of, of the Corval patients to a performance goal, a historical control group um, derived from um, meta-analysis of several BAV or balloon valvuloplasty studies, uh, which probably has little long-range impact on mortality. Um, and compared to this performance goal of 43% mortality or stroke um, at one year, the core valve had uh, uh, um, incurred a significant benefit with a, a reduction of about 40% um, in terms of mortality and stroke um, and an uh, absolute 25% mortality and stroke rate at one year. Um, here you can see the mortality by itself, uh, both all-cause mortality and cardiovascular mortality. And here you can see the stroke rate pretty low at 4.1% at one year um, with re uh, relative to uh, uh, these patients. Um, procedural outcomes, bleeding, 11.7%. Vascular complications, 8.3%. Pacemaker, 22%. Uh, with all these results, I think it's generally um, thought that these results are put this valve uh, up for potential FDA approval um, next year. It's not probably uh, legitimate totally to do this, but uh, everybody tends to want to know how does the core valve stack up to um, the sapien valve, and so uh, I've done a, just a simple cross uh, trial comparison here using this, this chart. Um, no p-values or anything like that, but um, you can see there may be a few red flags if you just look at the partner study, the partner two study, and the core valve study. Um, maybe a little reduction with core valve in the stroke rate. Uh, that's been talked about. Um, uh, maybe a little uh, or a substantially lower perivalvular regurgitation rate in the core valve patients, um, but obviously a significantly higher pacemaker rate in the core valve patients. At least that's how it appears looking at these absolute numbers. This is not really a, a valid comparison of the valves, um, uh, but um, there have been no randomized controlled head-to-head -head studies. There has been one um, study uh, looking at patients in a registry um, who received TAVR, uh, 204 propensity matched AS patients um, who underwent TAVR with either core valve or sapien were, were compared. And here you can see in this, in this European registry study where core valve and sapien have been used longer in the United States, there's really no difference in all-cause mortality, cardiac mortality, uh, major, major stroke in these patients. The only difference at all in these outcomes was a higher incidence of pacemaker in the core valve patients uh, with a 22% need of pacemaker compared to 6% in the sapien patients. The other, um, it, whoops, let's see here. The other issue, the perivalvular regurgitation, uh, which was strikingly different if you looked at cross trials. Again, a kind of a subjective thing that's, that's to some degree difficult to um, objectively evaluate. Well, anyway, in the pragmatic registry of these propensity matched um, core valve and sapien patients, there's really no difference in perivalvular regurgitation. Um, a slight tendency towards the core valve having a bit more. Similarly, in the France 2 um, European registry and the UK TAVI um, registry, uh, there were, were no real differences in perivalvular regurgitation between core valve and sapien valve. Um, uh, maybe a tendency, again, for the core valve to have a little bit more. But the bottom line is, um, for the most part, until we, we start using both and there's a randomized controlled trial comparing both, um, besides the difference in pacemakers, uh, we, we probably won't be thinking about much else being different about the valves in terms of outcomes. I'd like to talk a little bit about commercial TAVR outcomes. Um, commercial TAVR uh, uh, was introduced after the one-year results of Partner B were um, presented in November of 2011. Um, it was first uh, then, it was in November 2011, it was approved by the FDA. Um, since then, about 250 different sites in the United States have um, started to perform TAVR, and they've been all essentially required to participate in this TVT, or transvalvular therapy registry. Um, in this figure, you see the 187 sites that have, been, that have performed more than 10 cases uh, since November of 2011. 
Um, Emory is probably somewhere in this area over here. Um, the bottom line is you can see that the average volume is around 20, 25 cases over that one and a half year period of time um, with an average STS score of around seven. I've just these results are from the TVT registry, again, from November 2011 to May 2013 were recently published in JAMA. And you can see here, um, kind of get an idea of what kind of patients are having TAVR performed uh, since the partner study was re released. Um, still, the patients are relatively elderly. Um, you can see their STS score is 7% uh, compared to a partner mean STS score of 11.4%. Um, 20% of the patients were in the, in the United States who had commercial TAVR were deemed to be inoperable, 80% high risk, 10% um, with a hostile chest or 8% with a porcelain aorta. The bottom line though is the biggest difference is, um, the striking difference is there may be a tendency to do less risk patients that were involved in the partner studies um, with 11.4 versus 7% STS scores. Is there a risk creep? Um, Possibly. Here you see how the procedures were performed. Almost all of them in a hybrid OR cath lab. All of them with general anesthesia. Most of them with some sort of surgical uh, procedure uh, associated with them, either a cut down for the femoral artery exposure or a transapical um, uh, exposure and delivery of the valve. Uh, the success of the delivery of the valve was reasonably high um, considering uh, it's early experience, 92%. Here you see some um, outcomes. Uh, outcomes, mortality overall in hospital is 5%, 30 day 7.6%. You can see a breakdown of the different um, subgroups of TAVR. Uh, mortality for the transfemoral patients was 6.7% at 30 days. That compares to a 5% um, uh, mortality in the partner B cohort. So again, pretty similar. Mortality um, in the uh, uh, non-transfemoral, basically the transapical patients, wet 30 days was 10.8%, whereas it was 8.7% in the partner A study. So mortality is a little bit higher than partner, but basically within the ballpark of the randomized controlled trials that were um, published. Um, here you see their uh, Complication rates, again, all within the realm of what was seen in the randomized controlled trials. So this, this data, I think, from the TVT registry in, indicates there's been a pretty successful rollout of this technology to general community use. Um, remember, they, they had, I don't know if you all remember, but they had lots of guidelines come out before it was um, actually released for commercial use in terms of the societies of cardiology and surgery came out with very specific guidelines of how it should be employed and by whom, as well as did the uh, CMS with their um, uh, coverage, determination of coverage announcement. So all in all, that strategy seemed to keep um, things, uh, uh, outcomes good, although there does seem to be some risk creep to the lower risk uh, patients. Future directions for um, TAVR, the minimalist procedure, as I mentioned in the, the community experience has been one where almost all the patients, um, if you can read this, had their procedure done in a hybrid OR, and these are recommended by guidelines. They all had general anesthesia, they all had, uh, or a lot of them had a femoral artery cut down um, or transapical delivery. Almost all of them had TE guidance. Um, surgical staff and cardiopulmonary bypass staff were, were on standby during the procedure and generally because there was usually a surgical um, access obtained, surgical uh, closure of the access site was um, also performed. The minimalist approach um, is something that has evolved in the busier um, TAVR centers. These centers, uh, the the uh, towers are often being performed in a cath lab as opposed to a hybrid OR. They're often being performed with conscious sedation um, and local anesthesia. Approach is generally percutaneous um, whenever possible. TTE guidance is, is, is frequently used. Sorry about that. <laughs> 
TTE guidance instead of TE guidance is frequently used. And finally, the femoral artery is, is generally closed using uh, percutaneous um, sutures. Uh, so this minimalist approach, we, we think, I mean, it's obvious that it's less invasive. Um, uh, it's probably less expensive, um, less people involved. And the question only remains, is the outcomes the same? Um, some publications have looked at this. Uh, in a registry type format and have shown that the outcomes are very good. Um, there's very low uh, incidence of conversion to anesthesia. Um, implantation success is very high. Vascular access success is very high. And the outcomes in terms of 30-day outcomes, death, stroke, et cetera, are all within um, the realm of what's been seen uh, using the more guideline-driven approach. This minimalist method is, is generally what we're using here at Emory, um, and, and stay tuned. We'll, you'll probably hear more about our results in the um, uh, near future. Alternative access. Um, transapical was the first uh, non-transfemoral access to be developed, but it does, and it works, but it does have some problems um, with it. Uh, it affects the myocardium. This is a study which um, shows that while trans transfemoral and surgical AVR improved, uh, let's see if I get my pointer, improved the left ventricular ejection fraction early on, starting at 30 days and, um, and out to six months, there was much less improvement, basically no improvement at 30 days in those patients who underwent the transapical uh, TAVR approach. And again, you know, the, the, the myocardium is directly affected by the catheter, which is being pushed through the apex of the uh, heart, and, and it's thought that this may have some function on myocardial contractility. The transaortic approach um, is an approach that's a little newer than the transapical approach in terms of its use, but it seems to be very promising. Um, 44 patients in this study uh, who underwent the transaortic approach were compared to 76 patients who underwent the transapical approach. Transaortic approach relies, instead of on a left uh, lateral thoracotomy, it relies on a uh, mini sternotomy um, uh, in the upper uh, sternum, and the catheter is placed directly into the exposed aorta, and the valve delivered directly into the annulus. Um, generally, surgeons are fairly comfortable with aortic exposure exposures and aortic cannulation. That's something they frequently do for other um, procedures. And basically here you can see that the median length of stay was less than the transaortic approach and the median hospitalization was uh, shorter with the transaortic approach or tended to be. Um, the feeling is that the transaortic approach when possible it, it may be um, preferable. Uh, it has a very favorable learning curve mostly because I think a lot of uh, surgeons are very experienced um, with this general approach. There's no myocardial injury um, and there may be less respiratory impact in the sense that the lateral thoracotomy may be a little bit more uncomfortable for a, for a patient um, to heal up from uh, than the mini sternotomy. <coughs> a homegrown access approach, one developed here at Emory, is the transcarotid approach. Um, Twelve uh, transcarotid tavers, I think, have been performed to date here at Emory, um, this is, these are performed uh, via surgical exposure of the right carotid artery with the catheter being placed in the right carotid artery while the carotid artery is bypassed via a femoral, um, a conduit from the femoral artery. Um, and the, here you can see the catheter uh, going into the right carotid artery and you see this uh, femoral um, carotid bypass conduit. Um, Essentially, this has been a useful uh, uh, access technique for patients where neither the transfemoral technique nor the transapical technique nor even the transaortic technique have been um, reasonable due to various uh, surgical and clinical issues. And it's been um, effective so far with no deaths and no strokes um, in our uh, group of 12. Talk a little bit about uh, one of the uh, newer applications of the transcatheter aortic valves, the valve and valve. Um, basically, there are a bunch of patients out there who are having de degenerating bioprosthetic uh, valves placed, <coughs> placed many years ago. 
And um, these patients, of course, um, facing a redo surgery to replace their bioprosthetic valve have a relatively higher risk. Um, and they are a, a prime target for possibly uh, being treated with uh, a transcatheter aortic valve. Um, there's a lot of these that have been done so far in the world. A registry um, including 554 patients who um, had degenerated prosthetic valves that were treated with a valve, tra transcatheter valve placed inside their degenerated valve is seen here. And you can see here that gradients improve uh, substantially, that aortic regurgitation uh, basically disappears, and that uh, NYHA class improves. And it's been a good option for a lot of these otherwise high-risk surgical patients. Um, there's some residual issues uh, that need to be worked out in, in an occasional patient. There's coronary occlusion, um, issues with valve placement, but for the most part, this is definitely going to be an area of growth in the next few years. This, a similar strategy has been employed in patients who have degenerating mitral valve bioprostheses. Um, over 30 cases have been reported since uh, 2009 in the literature that I found. Um, we've done several of them here at Emory. Uh, a, a valve, again, a transcatheter aortic valve can actually be placed inside either a degenerated mitral um, bioprosthesis or a mitral valve that has been, um, had a uh, valve repair with a ring in the past. Um, these patients, this, the delivery of this um, transcatheter valve requires a transapical approach, uh, and uh, so it's a little bit more morbid than the transfemoral um, aortic valve and valve approach. There also, these patients may require long-term anticoagulation. There have been several reports of um, thrombosis in patients who um, did not uh, receive uh, anticoagulation beyond an aspirin a day. But um, basically, again, this seems to be a viable strategy for your, the high-risk patient with severe mitral bioprosthesis degeneration. I'll talk a little bit about in, um, TAVR for uh, intermediate risk, intermediate surgical risk patients uh, with severe AS. Um, partner 2A is an ongoing study which is looking at this issue, um, looking at uh, patients about 2,000 intermediate surgical risk patients is defined by an STS score of 4 to 8% um, who have severe AS requiring treatment. These patients are being uh, or have been randomized to surgical AVR versus the Sapien XT valve. Enrollment actually just completed about a month ago. Um, and so uh, the mean STS score in these patients uh, it was about 6%. About 75% of the patients ended up, who ended up randomized into TAVR received a transfemoral uh, TAVR with the other 25% getting transaortic or transapical uh, TAVR. The primary endpoint um, will be presented hopefully in about two years' time uh, when uh, uh, we'll have mortality and stroke rates at two years. Um, that trial is finished enrolling, but another uh, intermediate risk trial, SIRTAVI, has just started enrolling um, here at Emory anyways. It's going to look at approximately 2,500 um, patients, again, with intermediate risk as defined by STS scores from 2 to 10 percent. Um, and again, patients will be randomized to surgical AVR versus, in this case, core valve. Um, and and uh, the primary endpoint, again, will be mortality and stroke at two years. And I encourage anybody who has uh, patients who might be interested in this approach uh, to uh, get in touch with us. Finally, I'd like to talk uh, uh, just a few words on new technology. Um, the field will uh, grow based on technological de developments as well as our clinical experience. And these are some of the new um, valves that have been developed by the engineers and companies they work for. The Sapien 3 is, uh, most of these, by, by the way, most of these new valves are designed to either reduce paravalvular regurgitation or, and or to be repositionable to ease um, to increase the ease with which the procedure can be done and the, air, and the room for uh, air. Sapien 3 is something that we're using here now at Emory in a registry. Um, it has a cuff on the outside of it, which in our experience thus far dramatically reduces paravalvular regurgitation. And, and should that be a, a major cause of, of problems in our patients, well, the Sapien 3 should, should improve it, at least in that regard. Um, there are other different valves with different um, 
technologies in, behind them, like the Lotus valve, which is really neither balloon expandable, I mean, sorry, balloon expandable nor self-expanding, but expands with a different mechanism. Uh, the Portico, uh, a St. Jude supported valve, and the direct flow, um, uh, another valve, all of which are designed again to reduce paravalve regurgitation and or be repositionable. There's some also technology being trialed in Europe and Canada to prevent stroke. Um, remember there was a little higher incidence of stroke in the TAVR patients. Um, this is one of those devices that's being tested, this Claret embolic protection device, and it very well may catch debris, um, uh, which most patients experience during the TAVR procedure. And, and therefore reduce the risk of stroke. We don't really have any great data on that at this point. So in conclusion, I think uh, what we can see um, over the last year is that uh, the studies that have been uh, presented to us reveal that surgical AVR still is the gold standard um, uh, for treatment of severe aortic stenosis, particularly in the low and intermediate surgical risk patients. Um, uh, mortality has been improving um, dramatically over the last 10 years, and I guess I expect it will probably improve some more. TAVR, though, is the treatment of choice for the inoperable severe AS patient. Um, Three-year results uh, show that uh, the result, that one-year results were durable and, and maybe even uh, better at three years than at one year. And so for the sev inoperable severe AS patient, who doesn't have obvious futility um, based on other comorbidities, TAVR is the treatment of choice. Figuring out who has obvious futility, well, that's, that's a different issue. It's difficult. Very high STS scores um, are, are maybe a guide in that respect. Transfemoral TAVR is probably preferable to surgical aortic valve replacement for the high-risk surgical patient, the operable but high-risk, um, high-surgical risk patient with severe ES. And that is because there's improved procedural outcomes, improved 30-day outcomes, um, and, and very similar intermediate term, i.e. three-year outcomes um, in the transfemoral uh, TAVR approach. Um, TAVR may also be preferable to surgical AVR for high-risk AS patients who have diabetes and, and or functional mitral regurgitation. Uh, the subgroup analysis have, have suggested that and, uh, and more experience is necessary in this area, but I think that's something to think about. Both core valve and Sapien XT um, which we expect to come out in the next year, uh, promised to potentially improve the current operative outcomes, less um, vascular complications, maybe less perivalvular regurgitation. Um, TAVR seems thus far to have been pretty safely disseminated throughout the United States in terms of its commercial use. Uh, the results are very comparable to those uh, seen in the randomized controlled trials, and, and, it, and it's a, a credit to the very careful um, guideline-driven approach to its use um, uh, that, that this has happened. TAVR cost is a big issue, um, and uh, the resources that it uses are, uh, are a, a big issue. And TAVR cost and even morbidity may be able to be reduced in the near future through a minimalist approach um, that the busiest centers are using more and more. Finally, this new technology, which hopefully will reduce perivalvular regurgitation, new development of access routes, such as the trans um, aortic access route, and, and our clinical experience promised TAVR potentially for the intermediate risk AS patient in the um, uh, future. Happy to take any questions, um, and thank you very much. All right, great. Thanks, Creton. We're open for the time for a couple of quick questions, if we have some out there. Paul? We have three microphones. One of them's got to work. Yeah, this is what happens when you retire. <laughs> I would uh, not be irony or strategy. I would not be very sanguine about that high pacemaker risk in a ventricle that has poor compliance. We see it is an opportunity to study the development of serious ventricular dyssynchrony in that population group. It may be that if average age is 84, the life expectancy will not be 
so long that it's a problem, but it, I would be tempted to look at that. Yeah, I think so the, question the, the question is, um, or the, the statement is, uh, concern about the high pacemaker rate with core valve, and I, I think I share your concern. Um, the early uh, data analyses that have been performed show that um, the patients who end up getting or needing a pacemaker uh, have similar outcomes to those who do not. But, you know, I agree that um, all things considered, it may be better not to have a pacemaker for all the reasons you suggested, desynchrony, not to mention cost, et cetera. So, um, you know, we're, we're definitely going to consider that, I think, when we, we consider which valve um, to put into a patient who requires a, a, a transcatheter valve. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thanks for time for a great talk. Um, one question, I mean, one key issue with comparing surgical versus uh, transatrical is the cost and also the durability of the valve. Is there any information on durability and how does, how does the cost of the valve itself compare to mm -hmm. the valve being in surgery? The, um, the Durability of the valves are similar uh, by our prosthetic. First of all, the durability of the, the transcatheter Edwards valve has been looked out to seven years, and it looks pretty durable, and I, I think I showed some data about that. Um, and again, the durability of the bioprosthetic versus the transcatheter valve in these high-risk patients seems to be about the same out to three years in the partner study. So I agree that, that durability is still an issue for those who are planning on using their aortic valve for a long time. Um, definitely an issue, and uh, stay tuned for more results that can only come with time, unfortunately. Um, the costs are, I haven't touched much on cost, and it's, it, it's probably an unfounded personal bias in mine, but I think costs can change dramatically. Right now, the cost of a transcatheter valve is probably three times that, uh, maybe more, people know, probably here know that better, um, than, a, than a surgical bioprosthetic valve. I believe that, though, that the valve costs will change as the market changes, and I think we can see that the market is going to change um, with the introduction of new technologies. So, you know, right now, overall procedures, um, the TAVR, there's been different cost effectiveness analysis, and, and some, some have suggested that the cost of uh, TAVR is the same. Some have suggested the cost of TAVR is more in the surgical aortic than the surgical aortic valve replacement strategy. But I think, again, that the valve cost has a potential to come down a lot. Oh, sorry to get your picture of that. Sorry. Not working. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Anyway, I think we'll have to uh, stop there. Uh, we'll ask you to thank Creton and just hang out for a couple of quick announcements. So thanks, Creton. Thank you. Thanks a lot. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.